All right, so uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Romans chapter 7. <clears throat> We're going to be in uh, that chapter in God's Word, or you can, wherever you use your phone or tablet. And uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to open up with a word of prayer, and we'll dig into our study today. Let's pray. So, Father, we thank you. Lord, I want to thank you for uh, your mercy toward us, your people. Lord, we, we ask for uh, special grace Lord, to help us in our time of need, God, we live in a, Lord, we live in a fallen world. We, we have a fallen human nature that we have to get out of bed each and every day. But God, you've given us this special gift of grace, your Holy Spirit, that, that desires to uh, become more and more and more and more like Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray that as we, Lord, open up your word God, that you would open, uh, your spirit would open it up to our hearts. And God, give us, I pray, Lord, just the, Lord, just like the parable of the sower that had the fruitful soil that was ready to receive the word. Lord, make our ears, make our spirit, make our mind, make our hearts ready to receive what you want to say to us through your word today. And so we just lift it before you. And trust in your ability that your Holy Spirit would preside over us and speak to us now. Speak to your people. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. We pray now in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right. Romans chapter 7. Got this cool little thing. I thought I would show it before we got too far out of the gate. Rich in the military in the past got this cool little uh thing from malta you know we were in axe not too long ago thought that's kind of a neat little thing i don't know what we're going to do with it <laughs> it's a giant handkerchief and i don't want to blow my nose in it but um i survived the steak bite that's what that says no y'all remember this story in malta that was kind of cool not completely related to Romans 7. So Romans chapter 7, the title of today's message I put in here is The Struggle is Real. The Struggle is Real. And I put it as a memory verse if you want to note it. You can, there's a lot of verses in here that could be a memory verse. There's a lot of quotable scriptures in Romans. But I put Romans seven nineteen For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil... That I will not to do that I practice. And I've divided up in three different chunks. So we kind of look at these little chunks, so to speak, as a, a sort of a topic. But for each little chunk there, for verses 1 through 6, Paul discusses freedom from the law. Verses 7 through 12 is how the law and sin work. Okay, we're free from the law because of Christ. We'll learn that in the first part. But how do the law and sin work together? And then verse 13 through 25, how the law cannot save us. Now, just up to speed where we're at in Romans, Romans is an excellent, it's really an excellent detailed account of the simplicity of the gospel that's being laid out. The first Two chapters up to chapter 3, verse 21, around in there, God paints us a clear picture that all the world, all of humanity, both the religious folks and also the pagan folks, right, are under sin. We're, we're condemned because of sin. You know, that's why it says in Romans 3.10, there's none righteous, no, not one. So he addresses it from that perspective. And, and D.A. went through 4 and 5, speaking of how we're justified, how the gospel, how we can be justified through the gospel like Abraham was by faith, but our trust in Jesus, not by works, but um, having a faith that works, but not by works being saved. And then in chapter five, the result of the gospel is there's a freedom from wrath, God's wrath, that the gospel frees us from God's wrath, some details on that. And then Steve taught Romans six, is, is in essence freedom from sin. Talks about how the gospel frees us from sin. And tonight, or tonight, today, I need to wake up here. Freedom from the law. We're going to see how the gospel, how we become free from the law. And I'm just going to read a couple verses 
to kind of segue into Romans 7 with a small illustration, because as the as we see in Romans 6, 21, and it's just a couple things. We see, what fruit then do you have in the things which you are now ashamed of? For the end of those things is death. So as Paul's speaking of the gospel and how you know, Christ was the death that we died with Christ, we should reckon ourselves dead to life of sin, right? He's saying that sin has this connotation of what fruit do we have in doing something, sin, that is shameful, right? Anything in any time that I've been ashamed in my life, or you've been ashamed in your life, it's pretty easy to ascertain biblically that it's linked somewhere along the way to sin, right? In verse 22 in Romans 6, it says, But now having been set free from sin, having become slaves to God, having your fruit to holiness, which is everlasting life, for the wages of sin is death. So the wages of sin is death and damnation, and it also is shameful. We see that that's what sin, the connotation of what it produces. And Paul, as we go segue into Romans 7, dealing with being free from the law. See, the tendency is, is when we have something that we've been connected to that we're ashamed of, is to add some rules to mitigate us falling back into that behavior. So there's a danger of putting extra rules into place, putting parameters in place to the point where we're following the law. All over again instead of Jesus. And what Paul addresses that. There was a neat little um, story I read. Talked about these two guys that were riding on a tandem, which is, you know, a bike with two people, one bike, two people riding it. And they were riding down the road and they saw a big hill and they're like, oh man, you know, big hill. Got to get up the hill. And so they're running, they're, they're on their bike trying to get up this hill. And the guy in the front's just barely getting the thing moving up the hill at all. It's a steep hill. He gets to the top of the hill and he's just like, Man, I thought we were going to fall backwards and go back for sure. And the guy in the back said, yeah, I did too. That's why I put on the brakes the whole time. <laughs> and this guy's like, you know, frustrated by this. But in a sense, our moving forward with Christ and our walk in the Spirit, which will be next week, Romans 8, we can hinder it with legalism, with setting up our own parameters, setting up our own rules, setting up our own things that aren't from the Lord and we cease to move forward in conquering the battles that God has us to face. So Romans chapter 7, I'll segue into that. It says, or do you not know brethren, for I speak to those who know the law, that the law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. Now, this is a couple of things. You know, Paul's the first time he uses the word brethren, brothers, since chapter 1. And so, as we get into this, and Paul's talking about the law having dominion over a man as long as he lives, it's sort of a common sense thought, right? You may have noticed in the news politically, somewhat recent, there's been a bill that passed both the Senate and I think the House recent where they are employing are, are taking 87 billion with a B dollars to hire IRS agents for the purpose of auditing, you know, our great grand trustworthy gov government. That's a great praise, right? We get excited about paying our taxes in here, don't we? No, <laughs> no, but it's, you know, we, we, we get a little bit uh, cringy when things like that happen. But the truth is, is, is if, uh, say example, something terrible happened, you died. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have to worry about that law, right? I mean, you're dead. The law don't apply to you anymore, right? You know, the IRS agents are going to show up at your funeral, you know, and just like, hey, buddy, pay up. They're not going to do that. The law has no dominion over you. And this is Paul uses as he gets into this chapter, this illustration. Uh, and we'll read through verse 6, and I'm going to come back and we'll talk for a sec. It says, for the woman who as a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So according to Jewish law, 
the woman would be bound to the husband as long as they live. Now, if you read, I've got some in my notes to further study this if you would like to, but Deuteronomy 24, the husband could divorce the wife in Jewish law, but the wife could not divorce the husband. But she was bound by that law to him. It says, so then if her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if the, her husband dies, she is free from the law so that she is no longer an adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, my brethren, you have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. That you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit to death. But if we now have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of of the letter. I found this illustration really good. I was reading this in a commentary and I thought I would share it with you. It kind of paints the picture of this marriage, so to speak, to that legalistic mind, that keeping of the rules, that following of, you know, that regimen of religion, right? It's a thing titled Mr. Perfect. And this is more applicative to the ladies, right? It says, Ms. Ladies, you wake up. And lying next to you is your husband, Mr. Perfect. My wife's supposed to say amen. I mean, it's like, okay. But, um, sorry. His breath is mint fresh and not a single hair is out of place. His pajamas are pressed and even the sheet over him is unruffled. He's perfect and he's your hubby. Good morning, he says, as he gives you a perfect peck on the cheek. And then with amazing energy, he bounds out of bed with a smile on his face, goes to his closet and takes out of his perfectly tailored suit with his perfectly start, white starched shirt and perfectly matched tie. He dresses himself impeccably. He puts his belt around his perfect sized waist and he goes into the kitchen to make his breakfast. He has no coffee, no sweet rolls, no eggs and no cholesterol. He has granola with skin milk and tomato juice to drink. Finished with breakfast, he picks up his bowl, rinses it out, puts it on the dishwasher, and sets the timer. And then he gives you another peck on the cheek, and out the door he goes to work. He drives perfectly, not one mile over the speed limit, nor one mile under, stopping for pedestrians all along the way. At work, he fulfills his task to the letter. And then at 5, not 459, not 501, he finishes cleaning up his spotless desk walks to his car and drives home. As you greet him at the door, you're again amazed that you have the good fortune to marry Mr. Perfect. But as he walks into the house, he stops and he looks at you rather quizzically. You realize he's looking at your hair because there's strand of it out of place. And then he goes to the kitchen and being a perfect six foot four inches tall, he notices dust on top of the refrigerator. How can this be? He wonders. Panic begins to fill your heart, and anguish begins to set in until you remember that you fixed a fabulous meal. As he sits down to dinner, you bring out the six-course meal you prepared, the aroma filling the room. But as you uncover the entree, you realize your husband, Mr. Perfect, is staring at the partially, which to your dismay looks a bit wilted. As he reaches for something to drink, your heart sinks as you see a spot on his glass. The evening goes downhill from there, and you go to bed thinking, yes, I am married to Mr. Perfect, but he's driving me crazy. This goes on until you become filled with so much tension and anxiety that you decide it was a mistake to marry Mr. Perfect. I want a divorce, you say. On what grounds, he asks the judge. My husband is perfect, you answer. Request denied, declares the judge. Perfection is no grounds for divorce. You go your way thinking that you can't last a moment longer when suddenly you remember Romans chapter 7 verse 2 and 3. For the woman, which says the woman who is bound to her husband only as long as he is alive. So the next day you see him reading the paper. You pour in a little bottle of arsenic into your husband's celery juice. You wait with anticipation as he sips the sip 2 and 3. Your anticipation turns to amazement as he asks for seconds until you remember that he's perfect in perfect health. 
His kidneys filter out the poison totally. Oh no, you say, I can't divorce him because he's perfect. He won't die because he's perfect. I'm stuck in this bondage forever. And in your despair, you slam the door behind you as you walk out into the rain. You return half of an hour later, sniffling, sneezing, coughing, and you know you're coming down with pneumonia. Your lungs start to fill with fluid. Your temperature rises. You get sicker and sicker, and you realize you're dying. As you let go of your life, you say to yourself, this is the way out. I'm finally free. Mr. Perfect couldn't be divorced. Mr. Perfect wouldn't die, but I'm dying and that sets me free to marry another one, Mr. Love, who's waiting for me in heaven. So I thought it was a good sort of an illustration as we look here at the law. And as Paul is describing this to us, he's setting forth this principle, as we read in our little story there. You know, the law itself, it's not going away. Jesus said every jot and tittle is going to be fulfilled. It's there. But you can't fulfill it. I can't fulfill it, right? And it's not going to die to us, but we can die. As Paul says there in Romans, we can be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead. We become dead through the law, through the body. And probably verse 4, therefore, my brethren, you become dead through the law, through the body of Christ. I put Colossians 2.14, it says, Having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of the legal demands which were in force against us and which were hostile to us, and this certificate he has set aside and completely removed by nailing it to the cross. We become dead to the law through the literal body, not the body of believers, but the body of Jesus' death on that cross. And now we're married to him who's raised from the dead that we should be fruitful to God. And here's a trick as it relates to legalism. We know through reading the Gospels, this was the Pharisees' game, right? It wasn't about their relationship with God as much as it was their relationship to the law, the standards and the requirements, and their ability to keep it, to enforce it, to add even more to it than what God had intended. And that was what they considered their relationship with God. And we can do that sometimes. We can do it in, within Christendom. You know, we're trying to move forward in our relationship with Christ. But you know, we got these legal parameters that we set up for ourselves that we can't meet. And we don't pursue the Spirit and the things of the Spirit. And we miss what God's wanting and desiring for us to be doing in our relationship with Him personally. And that's why we have to die to those tendencies. Right? I mean, I set them up myself all the time. I mean, how many of you have set up a through the Bible plan and failed to read it every single day? Right? All right. And others haven't started one yet. So <laughs> you're not even going up the hill. No, but it's, no, but it's, we have these tendencies, right? God doesn't love me any less if I read this morning as if I didn't. That's the truth of the gospel, that's the power and the beauty of the gospel. His love relationships predicated upon what Jesus has done for you in the cross. Not through our ability to keep rules and regulations. That's key. And it's key, as we read there, it's key to bearing fruit to God. Right? You can't just sit there and, and you know, if you plant a plant in the ground, you know, and give it a list. All right, plant, you're gonna, you need to do this. You need to turn this way in the sun. You need this much water. I mean, you can't just give it a list and expect it to grow. You know, you need to nurture it, of course. Give it good things, of course. But it naturally grows as it abides. And that's what we're to do in Christ. Uh, John 15, 1 and 2. I'm the true vine. My Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that he continues to bear fruit, he repeatedly prunes so that it will bear more fruit, even richer and finer fruit. And that's the Lord's desire for us. I put as a waypoint here, I've said the way shows us how to be fruitful by getting rid of legalistic tendencies. The way shows us how to be fruitful by getting rid of legalistic tendencies. Now there in verse 5 it says, for when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members 
to bear forth fruit to death. There was a guy I really enjoy listening to and followed for several years. Uh, made a standard for his kids one day. He has no idea why he said it. Somebody came to watch the kids and he was on his way out the door and he told the kids, he says, whatever you do, kids, and he said he's never said this before. He don't know why he said it to him. Don't put beans up your nose. And later that night, they were in the ER because the kids had put beans up their nose, right? <laughs> it's like, what is going on here? It's like, I don't know why. I mean, what the kids were thinking. But there was, the law was given, right? And the sinful passions within the children were aroused. And they worked in their members. Hopefully nobody died in that situation. But they had to get those things out. It's interesting how you put a law in place and all of a sudden there's an arousal within somebody's flesh to disobey it instantly, right? Now, verse 6, it says, but we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. This is God's trajectory for the Christian life. And Romans 8 really capitalizes on this because as we were in this chapter, I didn't mention at the top of the lid there, the uh, 23 times the law is mentioned in this chapter. 47 times I, me, myself is mentioned. The Holy Spirit, it's a goose egg in this chapter. So you're going to see Paul, the apostle, right, the, the man of God, some of the struggles he, he has a real transparency in some of these in this chapter, some of the struggles of what the battles we face as it relates to the law, as it relates to our flesh and sin and the law, right? In First Corinthians ten twenty three, this is a good verse. Paul says this I all things are lawful, that is morally legitimate, permissible, but not all things are beneficial or advantageous. All things are lawful, but not all things are constructive to character or edifying to spiritual life. Paul is really taking these parameters off in a big way in terms of putting a yoke. And even in Acts 15, if you remember, you know, they could have brought the 600 and I guess I forgot the number now, 600 and some odd Jewish laws. They could have brought that to the table at the council of the first big church meeting and said, we want all these laws in there. For, for, for the Gentile believers, for all these people. They didn't do it. It was a very simple, short list. It was sort of like an obvious duh list for anybody that has half a brain, really. It was just like, you know, don't commit sexual immorality. Okay, most people agree with, you know. Don't eat things strangled to animals. No rare steaks, please. You know, okay. It's just simple stuff to, to guide the church. Because he wanted the freedom of the spirit to flow. Now, we'll talk about the purpose of the law here in the next few verses, but you may want to note this verse, Jeremiah 31, 31 through 33. It says, The day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one made with their ancestors when I took them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I love them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. God's telling the people that were brought out of Egypt, Mount Sinai, Ten Commandments. That covenant's gone. I'm not dealing with that anymore. And he says there in verse 20, 33, But this is the new covenant I will make with my people Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my instructions deep within them. And I will make them write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. God is writing within them his word, his truth. That's what Jesus was a manifestation of. He was the one who kept the law according to the spiritual nature of the law, his intent. Not just the hard outside rule, don't do this, don't do that. But the nature of it, he's embodied it. You read the Sermon on the Mount, you see Jesus is embodying the love, the intent, the motivation, the spiritual nature, Paul alluded to as we get further in the chapter this morning, some of those things, right? And it's important to understand, too, that I put this down. Love does what the law can never do. The law starts as a duty, but love goes way beyond that. I was uh, listening to a pastor teach and talking about this point of how his 
had a chore. He had to go out and wash his car, his family's car, every week. And he kind of did it. It was a duty. Yeah, I got to do this chore. Goes out there and just kind of lightly wipes it down. Doesn't really get into it. Just, ah, uh, you know, drudgery, obligation, duty, law. That's what I got to do. So he does that. And he did that for weeks and weeks. And then around the time he was 16, he felt like he fell in love with a girl. And his dad said, you know, you could take the car. So that drudgery, he went out the next week to do his normal deal before, you know, fixing up the car, cleaning the family car. But it wasn't just a little wiping down. It was like waxing, polishing, vacuuming the car because the motivation had changed to I'm in love with this girl and I'm going, I'm, who cares? I'm going to make this go all out. You know what I mean? And that's where the love for the Lord, the love for the gospel can take us further. I put the way points us to a life afresh and anew according to our relationship with the Lord by the Spirit. The way points us to a life afresh and anew according to our relationship with the Lord by the Spirit. Now, verse 7 through 12, we're going to see how the law and sin work. And these are the verses on down to the end of the chapter, actually starting at verse 7, where the 47 times I, my me, myself is quoted. And it says here, what shall we say then? Verse 7, is the law sin? Certainly not. On contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. So it's as we mentioned there briefly, uh, there was a spiritual nature to it. Actually, if you look at the first of the Ten Commandments, I'm the Lord your God, shall know other gods before me. And the last of the Ten Commandments, Paul's going to quote uh, in his struggle as we look at Romans 7, thou shalt not covet. Those laws by nature were spiritual because you could look at the other ones and outwardly say and see if somebody was breaking it or not. But you couldn't inwardly see if somebody's coveting. I can't look at you guys now and probably you can't look at me right now and just see if I'm coveting something inside of my heart or that something besides God is first in my heart, right? Unless you're some spiritual heart surgeon, right, to get in there. Only the spirit can do that. So there's a, that nature that it is good. It's, it's, it's sin that is what it exposes. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said you shall not covet. So sin is this, the law is in a sense just simply a mirror. We've used that illustration. You may have heard that illustration before. The law just simply shows and detects this is my sin. When I look at it, when I read God's word, have I ever lied? Yes. Guilty. Now, I can look at that mirror and see, like I would look at a mirror at home. Hopefully, many of you did that. Looks like many of you did. <laughs> but um, if I look at that mirror at home, I can't look at that mirror and expect the mirror to be the solution if I got something on my face. I mean, hopefully, you don't take that mirror and just wipe it on your face, right? You don't use the mirror to clean yourself up. All it does is show you what is there, what is sin. This is what Paul's saying. Now, was Paul, when he says, I would have not known covetousness unless the law has said you shall not covet. Do we, do we think Paul, you know, it says lust, if you're reading maybe a King James version there, instead of covet in one of the words. Was Paul, did Paul have some wild lifestyle? Is this what he's alluding to? No, I don't, I don't think so. I think if you look at his pedigree in Philippians chapter 3, Paul was just emphatically devoted to, to the law his whole life, right? And so in part, while devoting his entire life to Judaism and its traditions, which in their view became laws in a lot of cases, that's what Jesus was busting the Pharisees' chops for often. But in the midst of all those things, my, my sense would be that Maybe there was a sense of, you know what, I'm a scholar. I'm at the top of my religious game. There is a sense of coveting prestige or a sense of coveting something that uh, was, I don't know, in the prominence realm of what he studied and learned. That's probably more likely what it was. But it is important to note just a couple of quick scriptures on this I think is helpful for us. I do think one of the most, one, you could say all, but... One of the commandments that, of those ten that we see in the Bible that Paul mentions here, 
that coveting in America is it's off the charts in a lot of ways. I ain't saying it doesn't exist anywhere else. I'm not saying that at all. But we live in an age, if you look at human history, right, from the creation until now, it's only within, really within this last 100, 150 or so years that advertising has really been a thing. Like ever. Now, right? I mean, it's all over the place. And you know how it is. You got your smartphone, right? It's listening to you. You know, you're like, I'm thinking about buying something. It appears on your ads when you're listening to YouTube or something else. And then you think, you know, depending on where you're at, when I first started doing it, oh, it's confirmation from the Lord. I need to buy this, you know. And some algorithm listening to my words, trying to crank out advertisements. But maybe it was the Lord. I don't know. But, um, but you know, it's just we feed. It feeds on this more, wanting more than what's necessary. And there's a danger zone. Where's the line at for each person? I don't know. I don't know. It's really a spiritual nature. Like I've said before, the spiritual nature of law. Because it is, in a sense, like, does it mean that a person that's wealthy is violating the covetous thing? No, that doesn't necessarily mean that. I mean, you could be a great steward for, for resources. And it's not for us to necessarily judge in that sense, right? But there is this thing that goes on in America where this is perpetuated. I put Luke 12, 15 through 21. Jesus said to them, watch out, guard yourselves against every form of greed or covetousness. For even when one has an overflowing abundance, does his life consist... Let me read this again. For not even when one has an overflowing abundance, does his life consist of, nor is it derived from his possessions. And then he told them this parable. There was a rich man whose land was very fertile and productive. He began thinking to himself, what shall I do since I have no place large enough in which to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I will do. I will tear down my storehouses and build larger ones. I will take, store all my grain and my goods there. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many good things stored up enough for many years. Rest and relax. Eat, drink, and be merry. Celebrate continually. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul was required of you. And now who will own all those things that you have prepared? So it is the one who continues to store up and hoard possessions for himself and is not rich in his relationship toward God. And it says this in 1 Timothy 6, 17 and 19. As for the rich in this present world, instruct them. Paul uses this as an instruction in the New Testament. Instruct them not to be conceited and arrogant, nor to set their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who's, who richly and ceaselessly provides us everything for our enjoyment. So things are for to be an enjoyment. Apparently the guy that stored up the wealth hadn't enjoyed it yet. But it says, instruct them to do good, be rich in good works, to be generous, willing to share with others. And in this way, storing up for themselves the enduring riches of a good foundation for the future. So they may take hold of that which is truly life. We see this principle at play. I see it every day. I know my wife, she see it every day. You know, you break out the snacks. You know, one of the kids wants more than what the other kid wants. <laughs> you know, I want all these. And it's like, no, no, we got to share. We got to mitigate. We got to share. It's just there. And, and unfortunately, even at that level, as simple, as silly as it may seem as kids, you see it with, unfortunately in America, you see it often done with the gospel. There's a, there is a real thing called the prosperity gospel where people are doing it to gain stuff, to get more things in the name of Jesus for themselves. You know, again, I don't, God blesses people. There's no judgment. If you've got a nice car, you've got a wealthy business, you're doing good. It's really between them and the Lord, ultimately. You know, it's really, it really is. That's why it's a spiritual command. I thought this was a good story. I'll share it real fast and move through this text. But there's a missionary organization I did uh, serve for for two or three years. This is almost 20 years ago now. And uh, I was listening to a um, testimony of how this guy and he has five brothers were taking care of his mom. They lived in a, she lived in an Asian country. And they all gave her money. To support their mom because her dad had passed away and she finally died 
And they went to go see, you know, all right, let's help manage the estate, manage whatever she has left. And, and they went to, to, to investigate, you know, what's left. She's probably, you know, thinking in their minds, they got five sons, they're all supporting you. This lady must have like a ton of money stored away somewhere. And uh, they go and they look and they couldn't find anything. They found nothing except this little sheet that she had underneath her mattress pillow. And it had a list of individuals that were in different areas preaching the gospel that she was sending support toward. There was no money left. She'd given it all away. I thought that was a kind of a cool story, right? You know. But anyway, it says, The way doesn't hoard for itself. I put this as a waypoint. The way doesn't hoard for itself, but seeks to be generous for the sake of the gospel. The way doesn't hoard for itself, but seeks to be generous for the gospel. Now, verse 8, fall back into the dilemma here. But sin, taking the opportunity by the commandment, produced in me all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I put this story, it says, of a waterfront hotel in Florida that was concerned people might try to fish from balconies. So they put up signs on the balcony of the motel, no fishing from the balcony. They had constant problems with people fishing from balconies with lines and sinker weights, breaking windows, bothering people in the rooms below. They finally solved the problem by taking down the signs. And no one thought the fish from the balconies because they didn't put a sign there. They said no fishing from the balconies. And it's, again, we just see that fallen nature at work. I think Steve a few weeks ago said, you know, if you want to get something done, you either do it yourself, hire someone to do it, or forbid your child to do it. Right? I thought that was good. Verse 9, I was alive once without the law. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it killed me. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, just, and good. So it's, it's, it's a good thing. You know, it's, it's alive once without the law. I mean, imagine you're driving 80 miles per hour and there's no posted speed limits. You're good. I'm good. I'm good. I'm just driving. There ain't no speed limit here. You see a speed limit five sign that says 35. Whoa! You know what I mean? You, you, you die. You're like, oh. You're looking around. Make sure no cops are paying attention to you. That, that commandment, it has a good purpose mixed into it. But it ultimately kills us because we see in the mirror, I fall short of the glory. I can't do this. So, the last part here, verse 13 through 25. The law cannot save us. The law cannot save us. Has then what has become death to me, has, has what is good, verse 13, become death to me? Certainly not. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good. Not that sin through the commandment, so that the sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. This is, I think, a very important component if you are on the hoof and you share, your, share the gospel. There's a ministry, I use some of their uh, literature and things that does evangelistic uh, like tracts and different things, uh, called Living Waters. If you've ever seen them, or it's uh, Way of the Master, it was an episode, just TV series on Christian channels, Way of the Master, Kirk Cameron, Ray Comfort. They produce some really good stuff. And a lot of it's centered around the evangelistic style, is centered around presenting the commandments to people to help show them that they're in sin so that they'll turn to Jesus. That's what the fundamental aspect of it is. And these scriptures are used as part of that. Because the sin does, when you show somebody the law, it does show how sinful it truly is. Just like the example I gave you when you see the speed limit sign, you're like, whoa, you know. It does do that. I mean, if you go up to a person that's presumably, and this is what this happens a lot in our culture, presumably a lot of people, and even the Bible says this, each man will proclaim his own goodness. It talks about that in Proverbs. There's that tendency to come off as, I'm good, yeah, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. But if you start asking these little simple questions, have you, well, okay, that's great. I can ask you a simple co couple questions uh, as it relates to God's commandments. Just see how good you are. Sure. Have you ever told a lie? Well, yeah, sure. I guess I have, right? 
Well, how, and sometimes I'll ask the question, how many lies have you told in your life? And they'll say thousands. And I say, well, what do you call a person who's told thousands of lies? A liar, right? That's just one of God's commandments. You know, you shouldn't bear false witness. But just opening it up, letting it expose, shows, you know, wow, thousands of times. Wow, I am sort of a jerk. Man. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like you start seeing the depth of your sin. But just a simple observation as it relates to God's commands. That can drive people to Jesus if used correctly. Now, verse 14, and we know that the law is spiritual Paul says, but I am carnal, sold under sin. If you read 1 Corinthians chapters 2 and 3, Paul talks about the natural man, which is a person that's unsaved. And, that, and you can go do this on your own. I'm going to cover all that now. And then he talks about the spiritual man, one who's living a life after the spirit. And then he talks about the carnal man. And he starts going through and just painting a picture for the Corinthians. like, you guys, are, we're carnal here. You're, you're worried about following this person, that person, this thing, that thing. It's about Jesus and his kingdom is essentially what we should be about. But Paul's saying about himself here, I am carnal. I am sold under sin. I am under this rubric of sin. Verse 15, for what am I doing? I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. Does that sound familiar to any of you dieters out there? <laughs> I don't want to eat that, but then I eat it. You know, we have that struggle. It's the same with God's word, with God's commands, with setting up legalistic parameters. I try to do devotions, but then I miss a day. Ah, I'm discouraged, depressed. Verse 16, if then I do what I will not to do, I agree that the law that is good. Now, this is, uh, this is something that's uh, a good diagnostic sort of test of a person that's really born again, in a sense. What I mean by that is that there is that sense if there's not a war going on with a dead person, right? If a person's dead in sin, and they're living for sin, and they're whole hog, you know, pig in the mud, woo every day in their sin, but then you got a person that's got the spirit of God in them saying, he's got that check in them saying, man, that's, I want to do what's right, but I uh, still struggle with doing what's wrong. I don't like doing what's wrong. There's that sense that, that, that there's an agreement with what God is saying is true, but also there is a sense, I ain't saying that as a hundred percent of the time, but it could be a sense of somebody either getting closer to being convicted so they can be led to Christ, or it's a person that may be in Christ that's carnal and struggling, right? It says then, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For the will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. Underline that scripture, please. I know that in me that is my flesh, nothing good dwells. It doesn't say... I know that in me, in my flesh, nothing good dwells except, I'm a really smart guy, or except that I've had training in this area before, or except, you know, fill in the blank. It's nothing good dwells in you, your flesh, this fallen human nature. You don't take a bath for a day or two, people notice. Hopefully you notice before people notice. You know, your flesh is decaying. It's rotting. It's dying. The carnal nature, not just the physical body either, but there's a nature attached to that in our spirit man, in our realm in a sense, that is, has, is prone to fall into its tendencies and desires. And this is, this is a wake-up call because there are a lot of people. I have people tell me. I've shared my testimony about how I got saved with a guy cutting my hair. And, and he kept chiming about how good I am. I'm like, dude, I'm just sitting here telling you I needed Jesus. You know, <laughs> I wasn't good. <laughs> no, you're a good guy. You're smart. You figured that. And it's like, no, only Jesus, man, only Jesus, not my goodness. It's his goodness to me that I'm redeemed, right? It's important for us to note that because all of us have this tendency to want to redeem something out of our flesh, but it's all to Jesus. 
Without him, we can do nothing, right? Apart from him, we have no fruit without abiding in him. That's all Jesus. He gives us the gifts. He gives us the understanding. And there's this thing in the body of believers. We've got to be careful of this. This is, very, this is, a, this is the enemy's this is a little warfare thing to keep in mind. We tend to, there's a psychological term for this. They call it the halo effect, right? You know, sometimes I get in a moment, I, I do something at work, and people are like, wow. And then they'll come and ask me about something else that I have no proficiency in, no understanding of. And they'll, they'll somehow think that I'm good at that. And I just, I, sometimes I laugh at them. Just like, you thought I could do that? No, but uh, it's like, really? <laughs> just because I said something about this and was correct, you know, I'm all of a sudden good about this, that, and the other. We've got to be careful in the spiritual sense because, you know, we've got this age of, like, prophets, right? You hear this, like, within churches, you know, this guy will prophesy something, and maybe what he says is true. Take it on its face. Yeah, that was true. But then he says something and does something, and... People think we have to believe and follow that because he said what was true over here was correct. But now he's saying something over here. We think we have to put the halo effect on him and believe whatever he says now. Because he's right about this over here. Just because you're right about this over here don't mean that we're going to follow and do everything you say over here. We've got to understand that. We've got to have to put up that spiritual antenna, the discernment. Because there's nothing good in our flesh. The enemy could take things and run with it the wrong direction, right? I put it here, look around and you'll be distressed. Look within, you'll be depressed. But look at Jesus and you'll be at rest. I like that. For the good that I will to do, verse 19, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. We want to honor God, but it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Now I want to do, verse 20, if I, want, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I do it, but sin that dwells in me. It's important to note for honest confession before God. Confession, the Greek word's homilingeo, it means to say the same thing as what God says. This is so important in finding freedom in your day-to-day -day walk with Jesus. We have to recognize this verse. It's no longer I that do it when I commit an action, but it's sin that dwells into me. We have to confess our sin. We have to agree that was sin. That wasn't because she said something and it hurt my feelings and that was it. Maybe it, something helped transpire that, but ultimately the sin came out of you and I need to get that before the Lord. He's already paid for it ultimately if you're in, in Christ through the blood. But for me to get freedom, I have to become honest before God. And say, God, I'm struggling with X, whatever it may be. And I'm bringing it for you in full confession, acknowledging it's wrong. And I look at the blood of Christ to forgive me for that sin. And the power of your resurrection to help me walk away from it. We have to get that kind of sin. We have to get it, acknowledge it and get it before the Lord like that. To continue to experience the goodness of his freedom. Because as long as you're in this earthly body, as we're, you know, our spirit and all that's inside... We're going to struggle with sin. It's going to be there, right? Now, verse 22. It says, Then I find a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in doing the law in the inward man. That's that born-again experience. Verse 23. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So we see this close connection of what is taking place with the law being presented, sin being ignited within our fleshly, earthly, fallen human nature. It wars at the law of your mind. It's interesting in Jeremiah, it says, the heart is deceitfully wicked. I would put this note down, I can't remember who I heard it from, but it said that the heart almost always makes a convert of the mind. Your human nature, your inclinations, emotionally, in the physical realm, all these kind of things, has a tendency to be operating in a fallen, broken way. The war then begins to take place in your mind, whether or not you're going to act on that behavior. And this is so key. This is so key. I was reading it 
thing on um, Ephesians 6. I got some verses in Ephesians 6 here. It says, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord, draw your strength from him, be empowered through your union with him and empower in his boundless might. Put on the full armor of God, for his precepts are like a splendid armor of heavenly armed soldiers, so that you may be able to successfully stand up against all the schemes and the strategies and the deceits of the devil. Verse 12, for our struggles not against flesh and blood, contending with only physical opponents, but against rulers, powers, forces of this present darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly supernatural places. Therefore, put on, this is an exhortation twice in here, the complete armor of God so that you'll be able to successfully resist and stand your ground in the evil day of danger, having done everything that a crisis demands to stand firm in your place, fully prepared, immovable, and victorious. Wartime mentality. We have to embrace that as Christians. Not like, okay, and I'm not talking about going, obviously this verse is saying not against flesh and blood. I'm not talking about, you know, get practice your MMA skills, get your weapons loaded up. I'm not saying to do all that, okay? I am saying mentally, as it says here in Romans 7, the war, it's in the mind. And oftentimes we emotionally get stirred up by a fiery dart from the enemy. We allow it to settle in. To get under our skin a little bit and we want to react without bringing it into subjugation to what God's word teaches this is what 2 Corinthians 10 is all about verse 4 and through 6 the weapons of our warfare again not physical weapons of flesh and blood our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses we are destroying sophisticated arguments and everything exalted and proud thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. We're taking every thought and purpose captive to obedience to Christ. Being ready to punish every act of disobedience when your own obedience as a church is complete. We have to get our thoughts set upon Jesus in such a way that our head is warring forward in the spiritual realm. And we're not getting sucked into silly arguments or social media spats or whatever else is going on in the world, right? It's so easy to get, let things get under your skin. I mean, people say, you hear people even, they automatically, when I hear a person say that, it's like, you know, I, I'm, you set yourself up to be weak when you say this. You say, I've got my buttons. Don't push my buttons. It's basically say, I'm, I'm, I'm really a, triggered very easily by a thing, you know? And I'm just going to act like a fool if you press my buttons or make me upset or some way to do something. That's, that's not a way to be. We should have our heads flipped around to where we're thinking, all right, what is the trigger of what God's word says for this instance? What is the spirit trying to manifest how I can be like Jesus in this instance? That's a healthy mind in Christ. And we need to get there because next week we're going to be in Romans 8. You want to get ready for that, right? Now, verse 24 I put Ephesians 2.2. 2. I'm not going to expound on that, but it talks about how the flesh and disobedience, how the enemy, the spirit of disobedience works in the sons of disobedience. That's the game of the devil in spiritual warfare, is to get our flesh riled up to where we're disobedient to the Lord in the flesh. And in those instances, there's a certain level of evil influence that gets compounded into those situations. You can read that more in the notes. Verse 24. So Paul looks at all these things, this war that's going on, not wanting to do what I want to do, and I'm struggling with this and that. And he just says, oh, wretched man that I am. Oh, wretched man that I am. Isn't that encouraging in a sense? You got the guy that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament just saying, man, I'm a wretched man. <laughs> I'm just a sinful man. Another place he says he's the chief of sinners. But it's just an acknowledgement of what's real, apart from Jesus. It's not, I'm a religious man, I do good most of the time, and I'm better than these people over here, and not as bad as those people over there. So he's saying, no, I'm a wretched man, sinful man. Isaiah says in Isaiah 6, when he approached God's throne, if you remember that chapter, 
It might be on a YouTube channel somewhere, not deleted yet. I don't know. I went through it a while back. But <laughs> he sits before the throne of God and he just says, I'm a man of unclean lips. He gets in the full presence of God and recognizes what a wretch he is. In uh, Revelation chapter 1, John the Apostle lived his whole life for the Lord, falls down dead before God. Like he just can't contain the goodness of his glory. Realizes who he is. We have to have that sort of heart when it comes to our sinful nature and our honesty before the Lord. If we have that heart as we get before the Lord, realizing who we really are, there's nothing good in our flesh dwells. I'm trying to do good, but I can't. I'm trying to get better, but I can't. So this is where I'm at, Lord. Then we can come along and say with Paul, who will deliver me from this body of death? Notice he says, who will deliver me from this body of death? Not what, not a 12-step program, not, you know, uh, procedures and programs and books and things like that. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Hmm. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Not goals I'm going to set this year and try to meet and... Then I can't, and then I get beat up and discouraged. Who can deliver me from this body of death? You know, an interesting practice that may be something that Paul's alluding to. Other scholars seem to think this, that when a person murdered another person in some areas in that day, uh, in order to punish the murderer, they would take the corpse of the person that was murdered and tie it palm to palm, stomach to stomach, head to head, to the person that committed the murder and they'd have to carry around the body of death until eventually they'd obviously be infected and to the point where they eventually would die from some sickness or some thing from that body of death being upon him. Who will deliver me from Paul is what Paul is saying. This body of death I'm carrying around, this fallen nature that I'm hoarding around with me day in and day out. Verse 25 it says, I thank God through our Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is the one that can deliver us from this legalistic tendencies, from this carnal nature that we fall into in our, as we walk here on planet Earth, as we continue to walk here in this world. And Paul finishes saying, So then with my mind I will serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Two points to finish this thing on. Are we, there's two, there, you can tell the difference between a parodical and a pig by how they respond to, to different things. You know, a prodigal might be in the pig slot for a bit, little while, right? He might be in that, that season for a, for a moment or, or a season in life or whatever it may be. He may be there for a minute, but he knows what he's eating is garbage and he needs to get up out of that pen or he's going to destroy himself. The pig, on the other hand, you could take out of that mud pen, you know, you could bathe it, sudsy it up, put some essential oils on it, you know, put a little bow in its pig hair, you know what I mean? All these wonderful things you could do to that pig, but when you release that pig, where's it going to run? Right back in the slop, right back into eating the garbage, because that's its nature. Where are you? Where am I? Do we realize our need to repent? Do we realize our need to get up out of the muck and the mire and the things of this world? Do we realize that our flesh can corrupt us to where we sin and that we need nothing else, no one else except Jesus? I put the way here leads us to spiritual life, love, joy, and peace in Christ's power. This is what Paul is gearing up for, for Romans chapter 8. Uh, we're going to pray. So everybody bow your head, we're going to pray. God, we thank you for the clarity of your word, Lord. I just pray that your Holy Spirit will continue to illuminate it to us. 
crystallize it in our thinking. Uh, Lord, help us to walk in the beauty of it. Lord, we can look at this chapter this morning and think, you know, I've got other plans. I don't need Jesus. I've got other things. I don't need to be in fellowship. It's easy for us to look at, think we're going to look at a YouTube video to fix a problem sometimes. And the reality is there's nothing in our own human nature, our own flesh, that's good, that's redeemable. The only thing that's needed is Jesus and his forgiveness. Just keeping in an attitude of prayer. If you're like me, or you're like Paul, you're still in the struggle. You still experience it. You still step in the mud. I'll invite you to, to pray along with me, just as a reconfession of your faith according to God's word, confessing to him your sin and your need for his forgiveness to be set free again and again. It's not... It's a one-time experience, yes, you accept Christ, but it's an ongoing growth to allow his spirit room to work in the sins that we stumble into. And maybe you're in here and maybe you're just like, I don't give a flip of what God's word has to say. I'd rather eat and get filled up on the things that are in this life. And I challenge you to repent. I challenge you to see sin as it truly is. It's damnable. It's deathly. It produces shame and guilt, and it will destroy you. I want to invite you to pray along with us to receive the fullness of his grace and his forgiveness. So just wherever you're at, you make it your own prayer from your own heart to the Lord, but I encourage you to confess as the word teaches us. Dear Lord Jesus, Lord, I believe in you. And I believe that you've died so that I could be forgiven. And Lord, I have sinned against you. I ask you to forgive me for that sin. That you would fill me with your Holy Spirit. Your resurrection power. To follow you. All the days of my life. And give me the power. To not fall into legalism, but to fall more in love with you, Jesus. If you're in here today and you've, maybe it's the first time you're receiving or you need to get retr- your track back on track and want some helps, Bible, stuff like that, come up here and see me. Another elder come up here and see me. That'd be great. I'm going to pray a blessing over you and we're going to take a 10 minute, maybe a five, 10 minute break. And uh, if you need to get your kids, if you have to go, you can go. But we're going to avail that time for uh, the elders will be up here uh, to help have some Q&A for some questions you may have uh, about uh, the ministry. And uh, we're going to do communion after that, I think. So let me pray. God, thank you again for your word. Ask for your Holy Spirit to bless your people. Lord, help us to, Lord, to, to be the one that dies to our own ritualistic, legalistic tendencies. Lord, we see the struggle that produced in Paul. We see the struggle it produces in us as we fall short. But Lord, you desire to deliver us that we might walk in the fullness of your love, your joy, your peace, and your power that overcomes all those things if we simply lean on you, look to you, and allow you to be our king. I pray that blessing upon your fellowship of your people for this week, for this day, for the next few hours of the day. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face, his light shine upon you. And may he bid you his peace, his shalom, in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen.